Well, how about you think about one of them while we just go to Idris real quick? Okay. Just, just one. Or maybe two. Okay. Can what? Home. Hope. So, uh, hope, okay. I'll tell you a couple of stories. One comes from the Greeks. It's a nice story, and I think I've told it to classes many, many times. If I have in this class a few times, my apologies for the repeat. And the other just from real life and the sort of things you need to accompany hope. <sighs> there are two brothers in Greek mythology. One's name is Prometheus. The other's name is Epimetheus. And they've done a lot of things for Zeus. Most of what they've done for this god has been quite dysfunctional, but nevertheless, they're relatively nice chaps. So Epimetheus, I think, is about to get married. And uh, he's to get married to Pandora. Now Zeus knows the sort of creature Pandora is. She is filled with curiosity, kind of like Socrates. You go around and uh, as Socrates would, walks around town and watches two people holding hands and he goes to them and says, why are you guys holding hands? He's curious. And the couple say, because we love each other. Well, why do you love you, each other? Well, because she makes me feel good and I make you feel good, so oh, so your love is based on selfishness, making each other feel good. Yeah, I guess so. So you guys are using one another to make yourselves feel good. Well, I guess so. And it gets to the point where the couple holding hand begin to doubt that their passion for one another, and things just begin to go bad from that point on. And that's one of the dangers of being curious. You know, it's like uh, when you're a child, you go to your parents and you say, so mom, dad, where did I come from? And of course, fathers usually step away from the question, uh, giving the woman the responsibility and the woman says, oh honey, you came from my tummy. Oh yeah? Well, can I have a sister then? Will it come out tomorrow? And then you realize this curiosity that the child has is kind of taking the parent to a certain place that is not so welcomed because you can't talk about having children without talking about having sex and then that brings about its own you know difficulties and so it's best not to be curious you come to this class for three units that's all you should do focus on the writing focus on the three units and you know get out don't ask, uh, so how do I become ethical? How do I become moral? How do I become reflective? Those are difficult questions because they kind of leak into every part of life. But Pandora, which is very much like Eve in the Garden of Eden in Islam and Judaism, she's just curious. She wants to know what this tree is. She wants to know what the fruit is. She wants to know what happens when you take a bite. She wants to know what happens when the juices go inside you and what wisdom looks like, you know. So knowing full well that if he, Zeus, was to offer this woman a gift, and on the gift he was to write, do not open, she would certainly open it, you know. 
it's like after class me telling you, but by, by the way, when you leave this class, just leave everything we've talked about in this classroom. Don't take anything home. And then of course you take it home, you go to your companion and you say, so honey, why do you like me? Why are we living together? And after a week you realize she's moved out. And now you have to deal with being lonely and pathetic and all that. So when the ceremony is over, Pandora uh, goes to her room and there are all these gifts. And she's attracted, especially to the one given to her by Zeus. On the top it says, do not open, and she does. And the moment she opens this, this box, all the awful things come out. Jealousy comes out. Anger comes out. All the emotions that you and I don't really like to have around. And at the very last, hello, at the very last, this particular thing called hope is about to come out. But the box gets closed and hope remains within. It gets caged. And I guess to some extent, it's a very sad story for those of us in this class who become curious about anything. Because there is so much you lose and there is so much you long for but you can never have. Imagine I don't know, you begin to reflect on, which is opening the box, on any part of your life. I mean, really sitting, examining, observing. And there's a good chance you're not going to find very many good things. And it's not a bad thing because we are insufficient, we are incomplete, we lack a good amount of knowledge, we don't have a lot of tools to kind of figure out where we are, what we are, what we're doing. So everything about our life really is unfinished. And that's why oftentimes when time passes, you get to a place of awareness and then regret and then repentance. And then you have a lot of guilt guilt about having spent or wasted a lot of time on people, on ridiculous things. So one of the advice that's given to us by the Greeks is that do not be curious about anything. At the same time, if you don't exercise curiosity, your life for the most part will lack depth and meaning. It's very superficial, you know. Um, I remember my mother-in-law she was making coffee and she suffered a very serious burn all over her body. We rushed her to San Francisco and after a couple days, uh, someone's daughter came to visit her. And this is like the burn center. People are screaming and wailing because someone needs to scrub the dead skin off of your body. It's just not going to go away and for the new skin to regenerate, to grow back, the old skin needs to go. And you're in a lot of pain. And it doesn't matter how much medication they give you, the pain is not going to go away completely. And I remember her walking in to say hello to this, to this woman, my mother-in-law. And she was on her way to a party. She was wearing a skirt that it was like a rope. It showed everything. She had no undergarment, so her upper chest was just everywhere. And you sit back and you say, well, how could someone dressed like this come to visit a woman, good morning, who is in so much pain? You should have some self-respect. At least if you don't respect yourself, respect this woman, 70. But no. And I'm thinking that upon reflection, becoming curious as to, is this the appropriate outfit to go visit someone who is sick? That would ruin your day, that would ruin your night. You would not probably be able to go partying afterwards, you know. And so one of the recommendations given to us by Zeus is, don't be curious. Kevin is in a lousy mood because he's curious. Curiosity forced him to go somewhere, open some boxes, review certain parts of his life and experience them, those experiences no doubt bring about negative emotions and feelings and thoughts. And then he gets stuck. What do I do now? Where do I go now? <sighs> so that's one of the dangerousness of being curious. You hope to find out. But what you realize at the end is not hope. You become actually quite hopeless because there isn't much you can do. 
That's number one. Curiosity is immensely bad, even though none of us in this class can walk away from it completely. <clears throat> the second is this. You sign up for a class, or well, let's do it differently. One day you wake up in bed and you realize you're all alone and you want a companion. It's nice to have a companion. Not a dog or a cat or a parakeet, you want like a human being. You also begin to think back and you realize you've been in five or six or ten of them and none of them have worked out too well for you. Whether it's the other person or you, doesn't really matter. You just come to realize that maybe you're just not destined to be in a relationship with any human being. But once in a while you miss being around people, you miss having intimate relationships. So you wake up, you happen to be in a relatively cheery mood, you take a shower, you shave, you wear your nice outfit and you go out to Pete's coffee shop. And as you're walking, there is this nice looking person across the room from you. All of a sudden, remember what attraction does. And you don't know why you're attracted. You look out there and you find yourself attracted to this person. And then uh, you went there because you didn't want to be home. You didn't want to be alone. It was just suffocating you. See, it's not enough for you to dress well and look yourself in the mirror and say, yes, I look so good. Sometimes, in fact, most often when you walk into society, you dress well because you want other people to look at you. They, you want them to affirm, validate who and what you are, that in fact, every time someone looks at you, you say, yes, the mirror didn't lie to me. My own perception didn't lie to me. I do look good. Look, all these people are looking at me. So we need other people to kind of become validated to some extent. And this person walks towards you and says, I couldn't help notice that you were looking at me. What's up? And you say, well, can I buy you a cup of coffee? There is hope. And in hope, you forget your past. In hope, you forget that for the past 10, 15, 20 years, you've gone through a string of relationships, but none of them really were successful. But hope is like this band-aid. You become blind. You assume that just because you're attracted, just because this person has walked to you, walked up to you, that this one is going to be different, okay? Now, it is possible and it is true that this relationship could work like anything else in life. But for this hope to turn into something very real, you need resources. You want to graduate. That's hope. And hope exists way there in the future, 5, 10, 20 years from now. But what do you need to do to make sure that this hope is not trampled upon? It stays true. It stays alive. Well, you take classes. For any hope to remain protected and to ultimately become true, you need tools. And you need to know how to use those tools to keep hope alive. What's the use of you being in bed, not doing anything, just sleeping and watching movies, and then saying, I want to graduate, I hope to graduate. Well, you're not going to graduate by simply laying in bed. It needs action. So it's good to hope if you have resources. If, on the other hand, you're like this person with bad relationships, history of it, and you just go in there with hope but no tools, you haven't really fixed yourself, you haven't fixed your emotions, you haven't fixed your past, and by fix, you don't even have to fix it. Understanding is enough, you know, because it kind of gives you some warning signs, what places you can occupy, what places you should abstain from. So as long as you have tools and resources and as long as you know what those tools and resources are and how they can be utilized or used, then yeah, you can bring hope to life. If on the other hand you just hope, but there is nothing in your tool basket, well, you know. I have a student in one of my classes. She wants to pass the class. I know these are not the essays that she's writing because her email and her writing is, her essays, very, very, very different. And her email is filled with slangs, okay? And the essays, it's like Noam Chomsky wrote the, the, wrote the assignments. It's beautiful, you know. Now, am I going to fail her? No, but 
you know, I know something, which is, hello, which is she can pass this class, but she's going to fail life. She doesn't know how to think. She doesn't know how to write. She doesn't know how to speak. You know, so what? She can pass this class. I'm not going to stand in her way. Life will eventually, you know, pin her like a good wrestling match. So I take comfort in that. Now, she can hope for all sorts of things, but in the end, it doesn't mean anything. So hope is good as long as you have tools. I had this friend, you know, she was from Afghanistan. In her childhood, she had some devastating experiences, physical abuse and all that. Went to Davis, got her degree, and then was an intern at, um, hello, yeah. at um, Highland Hospital. She's now somewhere working. as a physician, it's a wound inside her that has never been healed. She was relatively attractive way back then. I don't know how she is now, but um, she would hope that every relationship she would walk to, into, it would work out, never did. Then at around the age 27, 28, she got married, thinking that this huge band-aid we call marriage with all the beautiful stories that it brings with itself will have the power to kind of erase her past. It didn't work. Uh, she was divorced at the age of 33. She has hope. She just doesn't know what to do with it. It devastates her all the time, to no end. خشت اول چون نهاد معمار کج تا سرایا می رود دیوار کج. If you want to put your first cinder block down on mortar or concrete, you better show it's level, vertically, horizontally. If it's level, then whatever cinder blocks you put on top of it, for the most part, they'll be leveled. If on the other hand, it's not level, it'll eventually fall. Uh, Kevin, I haven't forgotten you. Oh, I know you have. I was thinking about the statement, the only constant is change. Do you think that's true? Unfortunately, I would still like to believe I'm 20, but I'm not. Can I ask a follow-up question? I'm sorry? Can I ask a follow-up Sure. Question? So if it's true, which I also feel like I can't believe it is. No, you don't. It's hard to stop time or like change, but what would be the opposite of change if change is constant? What would be the opposite of change? Change is constant. You mean stability? Uh, let me... I'm sorry, I, 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 we are in the business of trying to survive as best as we can. We don't like change. We don't like any kind of change. I mean, we've created religion, we've created politics, we've created laws. We have elders in communities and they're all conservative. They don't want change. I mean, look, the ordeal that America went through with segregation and desegregation, homophobia, right now transgender issues. I mean, they're all countercultural. 
We don't know what to do with them. You know, and the moment you begin to say, okay, you know what, let's just accept everything. Well, then you have a complete mess on your hand and you don't know what to do with them. You know, then everything falls apart. In some ways it's good because it allows people to, I suppose, live their life in the most authentic ways possible. In other ways, well, I don't even know what authenticity means anymore. I mean, imagine you and I being in a relationship. And you walk into the relationship and the first date, you look at me and you say, Amir, listen, change is the only constant thing in life. So, okay, what are you saying? I'm going to love you today and tomorrow and the day after tomorrow, but it may come Friday. I may look at you and say, I don't want to be around you. But I'm an animal like all the other animals. You know, I, I like intimacy. I have history with people. That history creates attachment, hope, desires, stability. You're telling me that I should be with you, but expect you to walk home and you not being there, period. But why the hell would I want to invest in such a relationship? You've done all this work for this class. Would you like me to change my mind and simply give you an F? Go back and read your essays very, very, very closely to figure out the logical fallacies? No. I mean, you have to somehow find some stability in change. You say, listen, change is okay. I mean, earthquake is fine, as long as the house is not toppled. A little shake is okay. All relationships have a little shake. And I gotta tell you, in all relationships, there are moments where people say, I am done, I wanna walk out. That's like a serious earthquake, but they stay. It's too much. So yeah, just, and young people don't like stability. They have wings, they wanna move around, they wanna destroy things, they wanna fly. But after a while, you know, hello Michael, after a while your wings grow tired and you just say, I wanna just sit somewhere, I wanna relax. And I wanna relax on a branch that uh, is never seen by a tree cutter. You know, I just wanna make it my home. And you know, you do all this work for one reason. You go to school, you get into relationships, so that at the age of 40, you can look at your life and say, thank God I can rest now. Because physically, emotionally, intellectually, you just kind of lose momentum and you lose energy and capacity to constantly just change, it's too much. Too stressful, you'll just die. But there is hope, right it is? <laughs> Kevin, are you ready or should we go to someone else? Well, you should go to someone else because I was just going to comment about hope. And you just talked all about it, so I can't follow that. I was really going to say exactly what you said. I was going to ask you a question on the offset, but you already answered. See, if you had your master's in humanities philosophy, I would give you a job and you can just teach these classes. I'll stay home in bed. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so hope creates expectations. Uh, if those expectations aren't met, it creates disappointment. Uh, what role does disappointment play? I probably have shared the story with you in the past, but maybe not, I don't know. Um, your question brings to mind Aesop's fable, story of sour grapes. It's about a fox who loves grapes, you know. Loves grapes and uh, the only thing in his way is a fence. You know, puts his hand through the fence, tries many, many, many hours, but doesn't reach the grave. And in the end, he walks away saying, oh, well, you know, it's okay. They're probably sour, unripe. <sighs> Somehow you find a way to deal with it. You know, there was a woman who was teaching at a four-year school. I don't know if it was MIT or Stanford or somewhere. Um, 
she was a physicist and uh, when you teach at a four-year school like I mean two-year school such as this you're on probation for about four years if you teach at a four-year school you're on probation for about seven years or sometimes eight years um, and if the committee doesn't like you they can just toss you get rid of you and there isn't much you can do especially after uh, the first two years so this woman is it's her seventh year and it's the last meeting they have in regards to whether or not she's going to be permanent. So she walks in with a good amount of hope that this is it. I'll have the stamp of approval and I'll be here at Stanford for the next like 50 years. And uh, near the end of the meeting, they tell her, you're going to be dismissed. I mean, she's no longer 20 or 30. She's like 56. So she goes to her office, I guess, packs up st her stuff. Um, and the following day, she goes in with a gun and kills some of the committee members. Depending on what exactly it is that has disappointed you and how intensely attached you are to that thing, that determines your action. You know, um, if you happen to be someone like, I don't know, Marcus Aurelius or Jesus or Moses or one of those folks, you know, you kind of come to realize early on that almost all of life is disappointing and death is not going to be another disappointment. You've in fact been ready for it for a long time. You know, it's kind of like uh, if you've seen the first Matrix when Trinity looks at Neo in the phone booth at a subway station and says, the Oracle told me I would fall in love with a dead man. That there comes a point in your own psychological intellectual evolution that you realize that this entire thing is like groundhog. Like you spend four years, you get your degree. Then you spend five years finding a relationship. Then you spend two years getting the ceremony done and you know getting together with your companion. Then you spend five years or six years raising the kids. And at the end of every chapter, you realize, well, you know, life hasn't really offered you much. And once you know that, you realize, well, the whole thing is hopeless. And then um, you really just try to remain afloat from that point on. So when it comes for you to die, it's actually a release from an awareness from this hopeless state, which of course, it doesn't mean you're completely disengaged. You are very much engaged, but in a hopeless way. So the answer to your question really has to do with how intensely you, your relationship is with that thing. This is our last week. Next week, I have to post the grades. Imagine th Wednesday comes and I'm not here and someone is standing in my stead. And let's just say it's my dean. Says, Amir died. Heart attack in his sleep, end. You may be sad, but the question you'll ask after a few minutes is, so uh, our grades? That's how it is, you know. You're here for the grade, you're not here for me. And so even though my absence may disappoint you to some degree, it's not going to be completely devastating because ultimately what matters is your grade. If on the other hand, you had no concern about your grade, you were really here for this class, but more importantly, you are here for me. If the dean said he's dead, then that would be a different story. You know, you can't resurrect me from the dead. You know, the way you cope with the disappointment is you cry, you scream, you shout, and you say, okay, well, let me see who's teaching the class next semester. The less attached you are to things, the less disappointed you're going to be. But you can be a beast. In other words, you know, there are many people who just fear intimacy. So they get involved with a lot of people. Maybe they even have a lot of friends, but they never get too close because they understand when you get too close, too close, you invest yourself in the other person and then you expect this other person to behave a certain way. And when they don't, you get disappointed. So to save yourself from devastation, you say, okay, I'm just going to go into this relationship with one foot You know, I'm going to save the other foot. I'm going to give him... 25% of who I am. And even if he's an idiot, 
I'll have 75% of myself left. I'll be sad for a day or two or three, but then I'll recover quickly. If on the other hand, you know, you're invested 90%, if you're in love, it's 100%, you know, and if this other person doesn't pan out the relationship, you're completely just devastated and it's gonna take you again. And no one knows the timetable. For some people a month, for some people 10 months, you know. So if you're like the Buddha, you can find yourself able to attach to anything because you know exactly how things are gonna go. Attraction has come about, you have desires, you pursue, you become intimate in some shape or form like you come to the office and you desire to have a cup of coffee. You have sex with the coffee by the cup touching your lips and then you pour some coffee in your mouth and you swallow it. That's, that's sex, that's marriage. And then you have two, three, four, five cups and then you say, man, the next time I see coffee, I'll puke. You know, once you know that is exactly how the cycle of life is, you say, well, you know, I'll be engaged in everything. I'll like everything. I'll even love everything. But I will invest nothing of myself in the relationship for the future. You know, and it's not a kind place to be. Assalamu alaikum. You dress all black, why? Huh? Why are you all black? For Palestine. Oh yeah? Yeah, no Yeah. You too? Well, do you know him? No. Ahmed? Yeah. Wolf? I've seen my lecture. It's amazing. Oh, you see our lecture? No. I saw you right in front of a... Uh, the top three that's on brand actually. Who is he selling? Brand of you? Yeah. Yeah. You're picking up an order. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, are you the one in Como? Is that? Are you the, the one in Como? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. I saw her. I thought she's not her. From. It's her. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And we're all black. Oh. <laughs> Man. Yeah. A lot of people. Six, six, five, two, forty, all black. Uh, well, that's very true. Um, I think it's the white cop in front of you that just threw me. <laughs> you know what? That happens all the time. Oh man. <laughs> Let me say one last thing, and then we'll move to Kevin. 